Chapter 1.4 B. The Universalia Problem in Scholasticism The problem of the two forms of judgment remained unsolved because tertium non detur. Porphyrius handed down the problem to the Middle Ages thus, quote, As regards the universal and generic concepts, the real question is whether they are substantial or merely intellectual, whether material or immaterial, whether apart from things perceived or in and around them. Close quotes. Somewhat in this form, the Middle Ages resumed the discussion. They distinguished the Platonic view, the universalia ante rem, the universal or the idea as a standard or example above all individual things and altogether detached from them, existing in haranio toto, in a heavenly place, as the wise Diotima says to Socrates in the dialogue upon beauty, quote, This beauty will not reveal itself to him as a face, or as hands, or whatever else belongeth to the body, nor yet as an abstract statement or knowledge, nor as anything at all that belongeth to another, whether it be an individual being on the earth, or in heaven, or in any other place, but it is in and for itself, and is itself eternally the same. For every other beauty only partly revealeth its beauty, so that itself, through the dawning and passing hence of other beauty, is neither increased nor diminished, nor yet suffereth any ill. Close quote. From the Symposium, 211b. The Platonic form, as we saw, stood opposed to the critical assumption that generic concepts are merely words. In this case, the real is prius, the ideal posterius. To this view, the label was attached, universalia post rem. Between both conceptions stands the temperate realistic conception of Aristotle, which can be called the universalia in re, namely, that form, ideos, and matter coexist. The Aristotelian standpoint is a concretistic attempt at a settlement fully corresponding with Aristotle's nature, in contrast to the transcendentalism of his teacher Plato, whose school then relapsed into a Pythagorean mysticism. Aristotle was entirely a man of reality, of his classical reality, one should add, which contained much in concrete form, which was subtracted by later epochs, and added to the inventory of the human mind. His solution corresponds to the concretism of classical common sense. These three forms also show the structure of medieval opinions in the great universalia dispute, which was the real essence of the scholastic controversy. It cannot be my task, even were I competent, to probe deeply into the particular points of the great controversy. I must content myself with a mere survey of the orientating allusions. The dispute began with the views of Johannes Roschelinus about the end of the 11th century. The universalia were for him nothing but nomina rerum, the names of things, or, as tradition says, flatus focus. For him there were only individual things. He was, as Taylor aptly observes, quote, strongly held by the reality of individuals, close quotes. To think of God also as only individual was the next obvious conclusion, thereby dissolving the Trinity into three persons, so that Rostellinius actually arrived at tritheism, that the prevailing realism of that time could not stand. In 1092, the views of Rostellinius were anathematized by a synod at Soissons. Upon the other side stood Hualemy von Champo, the teacher of Abelard, an extreme realist, but of Aristotelian complexion. According to Abelard, he taught that one and the same thing existed, both in its totality and in different individual things at the same time. There were no essential differences at all between individual things, but merely a multiplicity of accidentals. In the latter concept, the actual differences of things are explained as fortuitous, just as in the dogma of transubstantiation, bread and wine, as such, are only accidentals. Upon the side of realism also stood Anselm of Canterbury, the father of the scholastics. A genuine Platonist, the universalia were for him part of the divine logos. From this position, the psychologically important proof of God, which Anselm established, and which is called the ontological proof, can also be understood. This proof demonstrates the existence of God as contingent upon the idea of God. Fitch formulated this proof concisely as follows, quote, The existence of the idea of an absolute in our consciousness proves the real existence of this absolute. Close quote. Anselm's view is that the concept of a supreme being present in the intellect 
involves also the quality of existence. He continues thus, quote, In sooth, there exists something in which nothing greater can be thought, as also it cannot be thought that it exists not, and this, our God, art thou. Close quote. The logical weakness of the ontological argument is so obvious that it even requires psychological explanation to show how a mind like Anselm's could advance such an argument. The immediate ground can be sought in the general psychological disposition of realism, namely in the fact that there were not only a class of men, but in keeping with the current of the age, also certain groups of men who laid their accent of value upon the idea, so that the idea represented for them a higher reality or life value than the reality of individual things. Hence it seemed simply impossible to concede that what to them was most valuable and significant should not also really exist. Indeed, they had the most striking proof of its efficacy to their very hands, since it is evident that their lives, thoughts, and feelings were wholly orientated to this point of view. The invisibility of the idea matters little by the side of its extraordinary efficacy, which in fact is a reality. They had an idea, and not a sensational concept of reality. A contemporary opponent of Anselm, Guanilo, objected, it is true, that the oft-recurring idea of the islands of the blessed does not necessarily prove their actual existence. This objection is palpably reasonable. Not a few objections of this nature were raised in the course of the centuries, which, however, in no way hindered the survival of the ontological argument, even down to quite recent times, for it still found representatives in the 19th century in Hegel, Fichte, and Lotz. Contradictions of this kind are not to be ascribed to some peculiar deficit in logic or to an even greater infatuation for one side or the other. That would be absurd. Rather, it is a matter of deep-seated psychological differences, which must be recognized and upheld. The assumption that there exists only one psychology, or only one fundamental psychological principle, is an intolerable tyranny, belonging to the pseudo-scientific prejudice of the normal man. People are always speaking of the man and of his psychology, which is invariably traced back to the nothing else but. In the same way, one talks of the reality as though there were only one. Reality is that which works in a human soul and not that which certain people assume to be operative and about which prejudiced generalizations are wont to be made. Moreover, however scientifically such generalizations may be advanced, it must not be forgotten that science is not the summa of life, that it is indeed only one of the psychological attitudes, only one of the forms of human thought. The ontological argument is neither argument nor proof, but merely the psychological verification of the fact that there is a class of men for whom a definite idea has efficacy and reality, a reality which practically rivals the world of perception. The sensationalist relies upon the certainty of his reality, and the man of the idea adheres to his psychological reality. Psychology has to recognize the existence of these two, or more, types, and must under all circumstances avoid thinking of one as a misconception of the other, and it should never seriously try to reduce one type to the other, as though everything essentially other were only a function of the one. This does not mean that the trustworthy scientific principle, principia explicandi praetir necessitatem non sunt multiplicanda, should be abrogated but the necessity for a plurality of psychological principles still remains. But, quite apart from the foregoing arguments in favor of this assumption, our eyes should be opened by the remarkable fact that, notwithstanding the apparently final dispatch of the ontological argument by Kant, there are still not a few post-Kantian philosophers who have again resumed it, and we are today just as far, or perhaps even further, from an understanding of the pairs of opposites, idealism, realism, spiritualism, materialism, and all the subsidiary questions involved therein than were the men of the early Middle Ages, who at least had a common world philosophy. In favor of the ontological proof, there is surely no logical argument that appeals to the modern intellect. The ontological argument in itself had really nothing to do with logic, but in the form in which Anselm bequeathed it to history, there arises a supplementary intellectualized or rationalized psychological fact which, naturally, without petitio principi, or other sophistries, could never have occurred. But it is just in this that the unassailable validity of the argument reveals itself, namely, 
that it exists and that the consensus gentium proves it to be universally existing. It is the fact that it has to be reckoned with, not the sophistry of its proof, for the impotence of its ontological argument consists simply and solely in this, that it will argue logically, while in reality it is much more than a purely logical proof, for the real issue is a psychological fact whose occurrence and effectiveness are so overwhelmingly clear that no sort of argumentation is needed. The consensus gentium proves that, in the statement, quote, God is, because he is thought, close quote. Anselm is right. It is an obvious truth. Indeed, nothing but a statement of identity. The logical argument about it is quite superfluous and is moreover wrong, inasmuch as Anselm wished to establish his idea of God as a concrete reality. He says, Beyond all doubt there exists something than which nothing greater can be thought, and moreover it exists as much in the intellect as in the thing. The concept of res was, however, to the scholastics, something that stood upon the same level as thought. Thus Dionysius the Aeropagite, whose writings exercised a considerable influence upon early medieval philosophy, distinguishes in neighboring categories rational, intellectual, perceptible, simply existing things. Thomas Aquinas calls that which is in the soul res as also that which is outside the soul. This noteworthy juxtaposition still enables us to discern the primitive objectivity of the idea in the thought of that time. From this mental attitude, the psychology of the ontological proof becomes easily intelligible. The hypostaticizing of the idea was not at all an essential step, but rather, as an echo of the primitive concreteness of thought, it was taken for granted. The counter-argument of Guanilo is psychologically insufficient, for, although, as the consensus gentium proves, the idea of an island of the blessed frequently occurs, yet it is indubitably less effective than the idea of God, which consequently receives a higher reality value. Later writers who resumed the ontological argument all fell, at least in principle, into Anselm's error. Kant's reasoning should be final. We will therefore briefly outline it. He says, quote, The concept of an absolutely necessary being is a pure concept of reason, that is, an idea only, whose objective reality is not by any means proved because the reason has need of it. The unconditioned necessity of a judgment, however, is not an absolute necessity of the thing. For the absolute necessity of a judgment is only a conditioned necessity of the thing, or of the predicate in the judgment. Close quote. Immediately prior to this, Kant gives, as an example of a necessary judgment, that a triangle must have three angles. He is referring to this statement when he continues, quote, The proposition just cited does not say that three angles are absolutely necessary, but only that, if a triangle exists, it must contain three angles. But this mere logical necessity has given evidence of such a great power of illusion that people have framed a priori the conception of a thing that seems to include existence within its content, and have then assumed that because existence belongs necessarily to the object as conceived, it must also belong necessarily to the thing itself. Thus it is inferred that there is an absolutely necessary being, because the existence of that being is thought in a conception that has been arbitrarily assumed, and assumed under the supposition that there is an actual object corresponding to it. Close quote. The power of illusion to which Kant here alludes is nothing else but the primitive, magical power of the word, which likewise mysteriously inhabits the idea. It needed a long process of development before man once fundamentally realized that the word, the flatus focus, does not in every case also signify or affect a reality, but that certain men have understood this has not by any means sufficed to uproot from every mind that superstitious power which dwells within the formulated concept. There is evidently something in this instinctive superstition that will not be uprooted. It exhibits, therefore, some right to existence, which till now has not been sufficiently appreciated. The paralogism, false conclusion, is in like manner introduced into the ontological argument, namely through an illusion which Kant elucidates as follows. He is now speaking of the assertion of absolutely necessary subjects, the conception of which is simply inherent in the idea of existence, and therefore, without intrinsic contradiction, cannot be dismissed. This conception would be that of the most real being for all. Quote, this being, it is said, possesses all reality, 
and such a being, as I am willing to admit, we are justified in assuming to be possible. Now that which really comprehends all reality must comprehend also existence. Hence, existence is involved in the conception of a thing as possible. If, therefore, the thing is denied existence, even its internal possibility is denied, and this is self-contradictory. Either the thought in you must itself be the thing, or you must have simply assumed existence to be implied in mere possibility, which is nothing but a wretched tautology. Being is evidently no real predicate, that is, the conception of something that is capable of being added to the conception of a thing. It is merely the ungrounded assertion of a thing, or of certain determinations as an object of thought. In logic, being is simply the copula of a judgment. The proposition, God is omnipotent, contains two conceptions, the objects of which are respectively God and omnipotence, and the word is adds no new predicate but is merely a sign that the predicate omnipotent is asserted in relation to the subject, God. If, then, I take the term God, which is the subject, to comprehend the whole of the predicates, including the predicate omnipotent, and say, God is, or there is a God, I do not enlarge the conception of God by a new predicate, but I merely bring the subject in itself with all its predicates, in other words, the object, into relation with my conception. The content of the object and of my conception must be exactly the same, and hence I add nothing to my conception, which expresses merely the possibility of the object by merely placing its object before me in thought and saying that it is. The real contains no more than the possible. A hundred real dollars do not contain a cent more than a hundred possible dollars. No doubt there are in my purse a hundred dollars more, if I actually possess them, than if I have merely the conception that is, have merely the possibility of them. Our conception of an object may thus contain whatever and how much it will. Nevertheless, we must ourselves stand away from the conception in order to bestow existence upon it. This happens with sense objects through the connection with any one of our perceptions in accordance with empirical laws. But for objects of pure thought, there is no sort of means for perceiving their existence because it is wholly a priori that they can be known. Our consciousness of all existence, however, belongs altogether to a unity of experience, and an existence outside this field cannot absolutely be explained away as impossible, but it is a supposition that we have no means of justifying. Close quote. This detailed reminder of the fundamental exposition of Kant seems to be necessary, since it is precisely here that we find the sharpest division between the Essa in Intellectu and the Essa in Re. Hegel cast the reproach at Kant that one could not compare the idea of God with the fantasy of a hundred dollars. But, as Kant rightly pointed out, logic must be abstracted from all content. There would certainly be no more logic if content were to prevail. Seen from the standpoint of logic, there exists, as ever, no third between the logical either or. But between intellectus and res, there is still anima. And this essa in anima makes the entire ontological argument superfluous. Kant himself, in his critique of practical reason, attempted on a large scale to make a philosophical estimate of the essa in anima. There he introduces God as a postulate of practical reasoning, proceeding from the a priori recognition of, quote, respect for moral law necessarily directed toward the highest good, and the supposition or inference therefrom of the objective reality of the same, close quote. The essay in anima, then, is a matter of psychological fact, concerning which it is only necessary to decide whether it appears once, often, or universally in human psychology. The fact which is called God, and is formulated as, quote, the highest good, close quote, signifies, as the term already reveals, the supreme psychic value, or in other words, the idea which either confirms or actually receives the highest and most general significance in respect of the determination of our action and thought. In the language of analytical psychology, the concept of God coincides with that complex which, in accordance with the foregoing definition, combines within itself the highest sum of libido, psychic energy. Accordingly, the actual God concept of the anima differs completely in different men, a fact which also corresponds with experience. Even in the idea, God is not one constant being. Still less is he so in reality. For, as we well know, the highest operative value of a human soul is variously located. There are men whose God is their belly. 
Similarly, there are men whose god is money, science, power, sexuality, and so forth. The whole psychology of the individual, at least in its principal tendencies, is displaced in accordance with the respective localization of the highest good, so that a psychological theory which is exclusively based on any one basic instinct, as, for example, power or sexuality, can adequately explain features of only secondary significance when applied to an individual of another orientation. End of section 7. Recording by Olivia.